Good morning. My name is Maria Lucas. I'm the Communications Director for ATI. I'd like to thank you all for joining us this morning. Uh, we have what we believe is a very informative presentation for you today with uh, an impressive group of panelists that are subject matters in their respective fields. But before we, we get started, I just want to take care of a few housekeeping items. Due to the large number of participants, you all have been muted. We will host a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Um, so please remember to write any written questions that may come to mind during the presentation in using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom window. So now I'd like to um, introduce our three panelists. Joining us today is, is Danielle Moore, partner with the law firm Fisher and Phillips, Nate Seward, co-founder and chief industrial hygienist at Pathogen Res Response and Resource Alliance, and Jeff Huddleston, senior vice president of healthcare and environmental services for ATI restoration. We're going to begin today with Danielle Moore, who, who will discuss the impact of regulations and employer responsibilities. Danielle is a partner at Fisher and Phillips San Diego office and chairs a firm's development committee, which steers a growth and advancement of the firm nationwide. In her practice, Danielle defends and counsels employers against types of labor and employment lawsuits and, and also offers preventative advice. Amongst other awards, Danielle has been named one of the best lawyers in America, as well as one of San, Diego, San Diego's top attorneys, best of the bar, and brightest minds of San Diego. We're grateful that she's taken the time out of her busy schedule to join us today. Welcome, Danielle. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, and thank you uh, for all of you uh, for attending. It's an important topic, uh, which I think you'll see as we, as we go along. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Fisher Phillips, we have about 35 offices and about four, 450 lawyers. And all we do is labor and employment um, on the management side, um, defending you all when you're sued by employees and, and hopefully keeping you out of trouble so that you're not sued to begin with. Um, and that's uh, what I've done at Fisher Phillips for about 15, 15 years now. Um, this year, as we all know, has been unusual, um, uh, and I think my business is one of the, the few that has been um, extremely busy, and that's because, as is often the case, uh, when pandemics or um, uh, the economy uh, struggles, uh, employees um, sue, right? They tend to, to, to be desperate um, or angry or frustrated, um, and that, that comes out uh, in the courts. Um, and so it's really important, especially during something like a pandemic, that you're hyper vigilant and you're making sure that you're complying with the laws. Uh, so I've been asked today to give you kind of a brief tutorial on the laws that are affecting you uh, as employers related to COVID. I'll be honest with you, um, that would take me hours to do it justice. Um, I can't um, go through every uh, detail of the law, but I can give you the broad strokes and give you enough to where you can leave this presentation and know if you need help um, or areas where maybe you need to obtain you know, further, further information. Um, so to start, uh, I, I thought I would go through briefly kind of what the climate is out there, what I'm hearing from employers, what I'm seeing, um, and again, kind of the broad strokes of the laws that impact you. And I'm gonna do it rather quickly because um, we have limited time here, um, but feel free to ask questions or to reach out to me individually um, after the program. Um, so COVID-19 uh, impacted our legislatures as well. Um, there were shortened timelines uh, for hearing of bills um, and there was a lower volume. Um, in my state of California, there's only about 25% of what we normally see in terms of new legislation. Um, most of that was focused on uh, dealing with the pandemic. Um, and you would think that with only 25% of the normal volume that you would have an easier 
um, uh, time of complying for 2021 with the new laws. And unfortunately, in that 25% are some real zingers um, across the country. Um, there's some pretty significant obligations that are going to force you this year to implement new training, to implement um, updated handbooks, employee handbooks, and do all kinds of things to ensure that you're compliant. Um, and when the legislature um, was quiet, our governors and our cities kind of picked up the slack. Um, you've probably heard about a ton of uh, executive orders that were coming out of the governors in various states um, and the cities, the local municipalities. Um, a, a majority of the major cities in the United States passed some kind of paid sick leave law um, for COVID-19 exposures and positive tests. And so it's not just a matter of paying attention to the federal government or even your state, uh, but you need to make sure that you know what your local municipality is requiring right now too. It seems that it changes um, every minute. Uh, Maria, if you'd go ahead and move the slide. Okay, um, so the very first piece of legislation that came out was the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. It came out along with the CARES Act. You may remember the PPP loans. We do not have time to go through all of that, but I wanted to mention them briefly. Um, there is a new PPP um, loan program that is coming out. Um, so if that's something that you need, um, make sure that you, you know, talk to your Labor and Employment Council. Um, the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, which provided that 80 hours of paid leave, um, expired on December 31st. However, you can still voluntarily provide that leave and still get the tax credits, the reimbursement from the federal government. Um, so if you need help with that, you can certainly reach out. Um, many states also provided similar leaves to fill the gap from that federal statute. And then many cities and local, um, uh, local municipalities also provided for some kind of paid leave. Um, so if you haven't already been up to speed on that, which hopefully you have, uh, make, sure, make sure that you are. Okay, Maria. Okay, so um, COVID-19 related litigation. As I mentioned, um, when things um, that are, that impact the economy happen, that normally means an uptick in litigation. Um, so we've currently seen about 1,426. I actually updated that number today. It's about uh, 1,469 lawsuits related to COVID-19. The most common states where those are occurring in order are California, New York, and New Jersey. The most common type of case is surrounding the remote work um, and conflicts um, and leave for those individuals that tested positive or had some kind of exposure and have to quarantine at home. The second time is whistleblower, meaning mostly OSHA. Um, this is people who are complaining that they, um, their employer is not being safe enough and then they're you know, disciplined or terminated or what have you. The most common industries right now are healthcare, manufacturing, retail, and government contractors and hospitality in that order. Um, and what I found most interesting is the company size um, that is most likely to get sued right now are the small ones. It's the employers of one to 50 employees. Um, and then from 100 and 500. So I'm not sure um, why that 50 to 100 um, mark is lower, but um, that's what the research is showing. Okay, go ahead, Maria. All right, so if you go to our website, our firm's done a phenomenal job keeping employers up to date for free um, on our website. One of the ways that we've done that is this litigation tracker. You can see there it says the 1,426 cases and you can manipulate it to find out your industry, your size of company um, in your states, um, how much litigation there is and what kind of litigation so it can help you prepare. So I highly recommend you go to it. There's also a resource center there with all kinds of free templates and forms to help you navigate the laws um, associated with COVID-19. Okay, Maria. All right, I did want to highlight one case that's in Louisiana right now. It's the Norwood case. It's a wrongful death lawsuit uh, filed by the wife of a deceased employee. Essentially, the wife of this employee claims that the company didn't do enough, um, that they didn't have the adequate PPE, um, they didn't have people social distancing, that they didn't exclude people from the workplace when they tested positive, um, that they failed to provide a safe workplace and has sued the employer for the loss of her husband. And we're starting to see some of those um, cases similarly in other states like Pennsylvania, California, Michigan, and Texas. So it just, again, highlights how critical it is to be vigilant, follow the CDC guidance, um, watch OSHA, the OSHA standards and whatnot. Okay, Maria. Um, speaking of OSHA, it's not just about litigation in court, but OSHA as well has had a major uptick. So there's been thousands of COVID-19 complaints um, that have really overwhelmed uh, OSHA. 
OSHA has also raised their penalties pretty dramatically. Um, and all of their strength right now is going to COVID-19 issues, to doing raids and audits and uh, violations for employers, mostly associated with social distancing guidelines and failing to provide PPE. We've seen overall about a 30% increase. Okay, Maria. All right. Um, for COVID, OSHA, and CDC, the, the thing that I wanted you to kind of take home is so far OSHA hasn't passed an emergency COVID standard, um, but Biden, one of the first things that he did when he took office is require that OSHA do that. So they're supposed to come out with a recommended uh, emergency standard guidance on February 4th, meaning next week. So make sure that you're paying attention and I'll give you some resources at the end for how you can do that. Um, but um, I did include in here one state that has done something similar that I expect you may see come from OSHA next week. Um, go ahead, Maria. Okay, so this is the case study. It comes out of California. So this is California's OSHA. This is the emergency standard that they passed back in November. Uh, for those of you not in California, it doesn't apply to you, but I expect that often uh, OSHA will parallel what Cal OSHA does. And so this could be very similar to what you see uh, nationwide next week. It was really passed within the span of a week and employers had to be compliant a week from then. So it happened really fast. And I expect the same from OSHA. Um, so you need to make sure you're on top of it. Go ahead. So this is briefly what that Cal OSHA emergency standard does, which I think OSHA could similarly do, and that it requires a written COVID-19 prevention program, almost like an IIPP. Um, it requires that you give notice of, of exposures within one day, and that you notify the local public health departments of outbreaks. It also requires, the California standard requires that you give notice of what you're doing to disinfect the workplace, what your plan is to ensure that the workplace is safe and disinfected after an outbreak um, or uh, an exposure. Um, it also requires, requires that you exclude people who've been exposed from the workplace and gives very specific requirements for the timing of that exclusion. And here's what I think is most telling. It requires that you must maintain the earnings, seniority, benefits, and the job for those people who are excluded from the workplace. That's a pretty financial, uh, substantial financial burden, especially since people can be exposed uh, more, uh, more than once, right, routinely. Um, and so keep an eye out there. We may see that come to OSHA. There's also specific return to work criteria employees have to meet. You have to offer testing at certain times, weekly for outbreaks, biweekly for major outbreaks. You're required to give some training. Um, you're required to have certain air filtration systems. It's very, very detailed um, and rather onerous for employee em, employers. Um, if you, uh, perfect, thank you, Maria. If you haven't already thought about complying with Cal OSHA, um, you need some help and you need it rather quick. Um, you're welcome to come to us. We have compliance package um, that's pretty turnkey, but wherever you go, make sure that you're up to date and that you're watching what happens with OSHA next week. The other way, uh, area where we've seen some impact is workers' comp. Uh, employee, employees can claim workers' comp for COVID uh, exposures. Um, certainly healthcare workers are first responders. That's part of their job. Otherwise, um, it's pretty fact specific as to the positions and the employer. But remember, workers comp is a no fault system. Um, so you don't have to be negligent in your duties and providing a safe work environment for an employee to claim workers comp. And in some cases, they've expanded in some states, they've expanded workers comp during COVID to create a presumption that if an employee got COVID and they've been to the work site within 14 days, it's presumed they got it from work which means an uptick in workers' comp claims, and it puts it on you as the employer to dispute that, um, that it was not obtained at work. Uh, go ahead, Maria. Okay, so the last topic I wanted to mention is vaccines. This is what is most hot right now. I have employers coming to me all the time about vaccines. Um, the, as you know, the vaccine is out there, it's being rolled out. It's still mostly in the healthcare worker stage, um, but ultimately it will go to essential workers next and then so forth and so on. The EEOC in December came out with guidance that said employers can require the COVID-19 vaccine. There's some caveats to that, like accommodating disabilities, um, considering the employee's duties and the work setting, but by and large, the EEOC said you can require it. 
Um, now, in some states that have parallel organizations to the EEOC, like California with its Department of uh, or DFEH, um, they have not adopted that standard. So in some states, you still may not be able to require it, um, or there may be risk if you require it. So instead, you might want to encourage it or incentivize employees to take it. And there's a whole host of ways to do that. Um, you're also going to want to think through confidentiality of those individuals who are getting the vaccine. You're probably going to have to pay the cost of the vaccine and for the time that the employees are actually getting the vaccine um, as well. So those are all things to think about. Um, and it shows the surveys that we've seen show that anywhere from 20 to 50 percent of employees are expected to refuse the vaccine. So that's another thing you're going to have to deal with. This has been a really hot climate this year politically um, and vaccines fall into that as well. So you're going to see that um, discourse in the workplace. And if you don't know how to deal with that um, or you need guidance on how to deal with that, make sure that you reach out to whoever your labor and employment. Um, attorney is. All right. And my very last slide, I've been telling you kind of all along, it's really critical that you stay up to date and to expect changes next week um, and the week that follows. If you have an alert system, make sure that um, you're watching it, that you're reading, you're paying attention. If you don't, you're welcome to use ours. At the bottom of our website, there's a subscribe button. You can see it up there on my screen. You can subscribe to be part of our alerts and then you'll get alerts anytime the law changes or something major happens. Um, but whether it's our system or another system, make sure that you're staying up to date. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Maria. And thank you very much. Thank you, Danielle. That was amazing. Lots of information. Our next panelist is Nate Seward. Nate is the co-founder and chief industrial hygienist for PR2. He has performed over 10,000 environmental inspections relating to contaminated pro properties over his 24 year career. He has maintained some of the highest academic credentials, including a licensed professional engineer and certified industrial hygienist. He is an EPA and an IICRC approved instructor and has trained and certified thousands of students. Welcome, Nate. Thanks, Maria. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon for uh, everyone joining. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nate Seward and I'm with PR2. We are an organization that's focused on creating training and compliance program for employers specific to COVID-19. So over the past year, we've practiced a lot of things and implemented a lot of things like social distancing and wearing face coverings and washing hands, covering our mouth, those kind of things, which are all important in reducing person-to-person -person transmission of the SARS-CoV-2. However, an equally important part of solving this pandemic revolves around the cleaning and disinfection of buildings that we live and work in. Uh, very little attention has been given to the development of a pathogen standard of care focused on who is qualified and certified to perform the cleaning and disinfection in our buildings. Uh, I think we'd all agree that all reputable and professional industries recognize that not only is training and certification critical to ensuring the proper methodologies are being used, but also to ensure that employees are protected from occupational hazards. Certifications are also important to validate knowledge, competency, and understanding of a particular skill set. When it comes to our buildings and homes, there are numerous existing certifications uh, for the environmental cleanup, abatement, and restoration of properties, including those contaminated with mold, uh, bloodborne pathogens, sewage, chemicals, asbestos, and lead. So these certifications are necessary for and critical for our industry's credibility and to properly restore buildings back to safe and pre-loss conditions. Disinfection of buildings for pathogens, including SARS-CoV-2 is no different. Many of you are probably uh, seeing a lot of similarities with the pandemic and how we handle our, the mold industry roughly 25 years ago. Uh, we made a lot of mistakes in the early days of mold. Uh, one of the significant things we learned from that industry is without a recognized standard of care and a credible certification program, contractors would continue to use inconsistent unvetted, unsafe remediation methods, which ultimately leads to a false sense of security. And obviously the lawsuits can follow um, something that we're already seeing with SARS-CoV-2, as Danielle mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. So 
another reason training is important, it's the law. Uh, OSHA, CDC, Human Health Services provide guidance for employers to keep employees safe from hazards, including exposure to COVID-19. Uh, Danielle mentioned the general duty clause, which is federal OSHA's law that basically requires employers to provide a workplace free from recognized hazards, including exposure to SARS-CoV-2. It also states uh, that employers are required to train workers that could be reasonably exposed to occupational exposure to SARS-CoV-2. Now, this is significant because this essentially applies to every industry in the U.S. Um, beyond the federal OSHA standards and regulations, many states are now developing and imposing additional requirements on employers to reduce occupational risk of exposure and contracting COVID at the workplace. Examples, as Danielle mentioned, some of these uh, employer requirements include training of employees and evaluating exposure risks for various job duties, monitoring, tracking, and reporting of COVID-related illnesses, and the development and or updates to infection and prevention plans such as aerosol transmittable disease plans uh, or uh, IIPP, which is our injury and illness prevention plans. Uh, also, as Danielle mentioned, federal OSHA, along with many states, are ramping up their enforcement and compliance strike teams. Um, uh, Maria, you can go back just uh, the previous slide there. Um, and, and this is uh, being imposed on all industries. These citations and fines range in severity and degree. Uh, some of these were in the low thousands of dollars for maybe administrative uh, uh, violations, all the way up to serious infractions, which can carry fines up to six figures. Not to mention, again, the lawsuits that are already brewing against employers. Many of the citations have a common denominator, lack of employee training. Next slide, please. So the new Biden administration has just posted their national strategy for COVID-19 response and pandemic preparedness, which came out just a few days ago, January 21st. The title of this 23 page document suggests several key points uh, that are going to impact employers. Uh, two of these goals that are outlined in this document uh, are specific to employers with the objective to reopen schools, businesses, uh, and travel, which are directed through multiple presidential executive orders and with a pretty substantial funding request of over $500 billion. Many of the government agencies will also play a role in implementing this strategy, including Department of Education, Human Health Services, Department of Transportation, not to mention the Small Business Administration that will work with the Department of Labor to implement new OSHA requirements for worker protection. Uh, for us to truly get our buildings as safe as possible and reopen the economy, it will take both qualified and trained professionals along with the building employees to provide general cleaning and disinfection of the workplace. So here, here is an analogy uh, that I like to use. Uh, if you go to the dentist, the dentist is, you know, uh, hopefully a licensed professional that can perform deep cleaning on our teeth. Well, between our dental visits, we're kind of expected to perform our own prevention and maintenance by flossing and, and brushing. Similarly, if neither the professional or the employees that don't have the proper training to clean and disinfect buildings, then the overall hygiene of our buildings will suffer, which will increase the risk of infections and legal action. Next slide, please. So recognizing the importance of training and education, PR2, we developed a professional pathogen disinfection course specifically designed for companies cleaning and disinfecting buildings infected or contaminated by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, we understood that companies such as janitorial, custodial, restoration contractors, maintenance staff would probably be our first responders for the, the building side and would need to have a deep understanding and level of training and certification that would match the increased risks of the employees uh, for exposure to SARS-CoV-2, particularly if those are responding to properties with confirmed positive cases or working in high-risk facilities like hospitals. Uh, another aspect to our industry uh, are these professionals performing uh, uh, cleaning and disinfection, are they properly insured? Do they have the proper communicable disease um, coverage? So uh, another uh, important aspect to 
uh, to getting this coverage is having specific training and certification credentials. Uh, besides the pathogen disinfection course designed for professionals, we also developed the basic infection prevention course for typical employees working in the buildings. Now, these courses, um, they will help satisfy employer duties to provide safe workplace required under federal laws we talked about. Um, but when evaluating the numerous U.S. industries across the board, we decided to break these into two basic groups, uh, an office worker and a non-office worker. So the office worker course basically recognizes we have many similarities of office high touch point surfaces that will be consistent for employees that spend most of their time behind the desk, regardless of the industry. Uh, this training basically kind of focuses on these employees that um, are going to be you know, handling uh, office phones, computers, work desks, things like that. Uh, it also recognizes that office workers may be at a higher risk of exposure due to frequent contact with the public or that they might be in you know, bullpen settings or uh, more densely populated office environments. However, what's interesting is that in the last 12 months or, or probably the last nine months or so, we're seeing a major philosophy shift with employers allowing office workers to maybe work from home remotely. So that could be a change in what the office environment looks like uh, in the future. The other course is the non-office worker course, which basically is designed for uh, someone who does not work behind a desk. And now that is, um, includes tremendous amount of, you know, hundreds or hundreds, probably thousands of different types of, um, uh, you know, work settings. Uh, you've got bartenders, you've got FedEx Uber drivers, you have retail, you have uh, professional athletes, warehouse manufacturing, the list goes on and on. So, um, what we did is we basically put together a, a basic course that uh, identifies somewhat consistent hand touch point surfaces, but we recognize that there might be some specific training for people that are in those job duties that might need additional training. Uh, in, in order to reduce the risk of occupational exposure and maintain our buildings at the highest level of hygiene possible, it's going to take the certified professionals that can come into the building and do deep disinfection. But it's also going to take, uh, and oftentimes the occupants of the building are going to have to do kind of their fair share as well. Um, otherwise, we're going to continue to see COVID infection rates increase within the US. Worker comp claims are gonna continue to, to go up. Employer premiums are gonna go up, uh, putting financial pressure on employers. And then we've already talked about the lawsuits and, and uh, what they look like. So I, uh, and final, I would like to just, you know, say, I, I wanna believe that we've learned a lot of lessons from the mold industry. And I hope that we don't make those mistakes uh, for this pandemic. That's all I've got, thank you. Thank you, Nate. And uh, finally, we have, um, I'd like to introduce Jeff Huddleston, Senior Vice President of Healthcare and Environmental Services for ATI Restoration. Jeff has more than 40 years of experience in environmental health services. His certifications include EPA and AHERA Certified Contractor Supervisor for Asbestos and Lead Abatement, Certified Microbial Remediation Supervisor, and Certified Bio Recovery Master. He currently serves on the board of directors for the Southern California Indoor Air Quality Association. And as a seasoned expert, Jeff has been invited to lecture at numerous conferences for local and national organizations on various environmental issues. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Maria, for that introduction. I'm not sure about the, the expert part, but I definitely agree with you on the season part. Um, that just means I've been around for a long time, but. What we want to touch on today is some disinfection methods that we have out there. I think most people know what those are now, but we still have people on this call that have reached out and said, you know, our building's been closed for 10 months and we're going to bring people back for the first time. What are my options? So we're still going to touch on those uh, different options that they have. And for some of you, that'll be, you know, information you already know, but for others, it'll be valuable. We're also going to talk about the challenges uh, facing contractors that are performing this work. You just heard a little bit about it from Danielle and Nate, and also the challenges talking with our healthcare partners, uh, what they're going through. 
And then I'll close out with uh, a case study uh, that we just did here recently. So here's some of the applications that we perform. Uh, you can do fogging, electrostatic sprayers, UV light, uh, vapor hydrogen peroxide. And if you look at the pictures uh, from left to right, obviously a patient room on the left, a lot of hospitals really don't like any type of misting or uh, hydrogen peroxide in their facilities. They would rather go with uh, something different. So we offer typically the UV light. And what they would do is they use their own EVS crews to go in and do a deep terminal cleaning. And then we would come in afterwards and we use the UV light and it's line of sight technology. So it's not gonna get everywhere in the room. So either you use you daisy chain a couple lights together or you can uh, do a two point application where you put it in one side of the room and then hit the other side of the room. So that's the first one. The second one is actually the case study that I'm gonna talk about later, but that is a halo fogger. So I won't touch too much on that right now. That's an ICU room. And the third and fourth pictures, that's the electrostatic sprayers and fogging applications. Uh, you can see in a classroom. So we do educational type work. Probably the biggest sector uh, that we're working in, the vertical that we're working in right now is probably retail space. You can see this last picture is their dressing rooms and we're getting quite a bit of that type of work and uh, food processing too. Uh, next slide. So here's some of the big challenges that we have as a contractor. And uh, probably the first and foremost is keeping the safety of our response teams. Uh, Danielle and, and Nate hit that on the head that not only is there a liability issue there, but there's also um, you know, Cal OSHA regulations, other regulations for other states that uh, you, know, you need to train your employees for what they're performing. And you know, at the end of the day, it's just the right thing to do to make sure that they're all properly trained. And what we do is we focus hard on uh, proper donning and doffing of our PPE. So we do not only uh, videos, but we do hands-on training and we make sure before they're gonna go out there that they're, they're properly trained. Uh, vaccination is another uh, point. There's actually two points to vaccination. One is we do a lot of work in healthcare. So not only do we need uh, to make sure that we have all those inoculations required for each facility, because they're all different. Uh, some are the same, but most of them are different. So it could be a TB shot or they need a uh, hepatitis shot before they come in and work. And the other vaccination, you know, the hot topic now is the COVID vaccination. And uh, we do do an awful lot of work in healthcare. So their first priority was to get their own people vaccinated first. Uh, you know, which is by all means the, the right thing to do. And now they're looking at the supply chain, the vendors that they use. And um, that's why we, I think half of our people working in healthcare right now at least have the first shot and they're waiting for the second shot now. So that's, uh, that's ongoing as we speak. Also a big uh, challenge is the supply chain. You know, there's a shortage of N95s and nitro gloves and Tyvek suits. Uh, you can see the articles here on the right. Uh, you know, that pointed out, but we used to be able to get things the next day or the same day. And now it's gone to weeks and months. Uh, so it's, it's, you have to look ahead, you have to plan ahead. And then the cost of the PPE has increased so much. I mean, in some instances, a thousand percent in the last nine months. Uh, next slide. So in talking with our health healthcare, uh, healthcare partners, excuse me, um, you can see the two big challenges that they have. They have a lot of challenges, but the two big challenges are just too many patients. And so it's the labor of their own people, either their, their employees are quarantined themselves or they're uh, just working too hard. Or some of them aren't even doing the regular jobs that they do on a regular basis. So that they've asked us to come in, they've trained our staff to work along the EVS crews just to decontaminate the hospital. And I mean, we've all seen the top picture above, we've all seen uh, on the news lately of tents being placed outside and uh, there's just no room in the healthcare industry. And this is actually a space inside the hospital that they found that was kind of like a storage area. Uh, it wasn't used for patients and they had us come in and these partition walls are what we erected and they're made out of core, pla core plastic material. And so it's a plastic, it's kind of a hard plastic, but it's very easy to detail clean, decontaminate, and uh, they just wanted partitions in between each patients. But that's, 
you know, that's where they're going right now. They just, uh, they're at their wits end. So next slide, please. So here's some of our ICRA barriers that they've asked us to do um, in different areas. This one on the bottom left before and after, this actually was a, a containment that actually another contractor put up. It was uh, made of plastic poly, or excuse me, polyurethane and uh, with duct tape. And you can see the door, it's a pretty large door for gurneys to get in and out. And it kept falling down, they kept getting breaches in the containment. So they came to us and uh, they said, ATI, uh, can you make something more sustainable? And that's uh, what we did here on the right. This is again, the Coroplast system. There's other wall systems. There's OES panel systems, there's Coroplast, there's, you know, there's a easy guard, there's a number that you can pick. We, we prefer to use the Coroplast at this point, but our containment went from floor to ceiling and uh, easy to decontaminate. And uh, they asked us for viewports. So you can see the viewports uh, out here uh, so they can check in on the patients. And then this is just a regular core plast wall that for, used for like a renovation on the bottom right. And uh, actually almost all renovations have stopped at this point. Uh, they're just trying to deal with, uh, you know, the COVID outbreak. And so, but this is a, a system, it's, it's, a, it's not fire rated. Uh, that would need to be a drywall system, a two hour drywall system, but this is fire retardant. So uh, you have to take that into consideration. Uh, this, these upper two pictures are actually um, a hospital in the Northwest where they get a lot of rain. And the engineering department could not figure out how to uh, put in uh, or actually exhaust out of the building. So what we did is we took this uh, circle window out and we put plexiglass there, cut a hole in it. And this was the only place that we could exhaust outside the, the hospital. So we worked with the engineering department and we knew that they, they got so much rain in the Northwest that we were worried about moisture coming in through the duct system. So we ended up uh, putting this deflector cap on the outside of the, uh, the duct system just so we wouldn't get a lot of rain inside the hospital. Uh, next slide, please. And this is, uh, this is the last of what I have. This is uh, a case study uh, I'm actually going to read a recap from our project director who worked on this project. Uh, there were, I believe, 12 ICU rooms, and uh, we worked with the infection control department, the EVS department, and the facility engineering to develop a site-specific disinfection management plan, a DMP. And their EVS staff went in and performed terminal cleaning and PPE. And after they did it once, they went back in and did it twice because they were doing sampling, and the sampling was uh, coming back uh, not as cleanly as they wanted it to be. And uh, their engineering chef, they shut down the uh, HVAC system serving the patient rooms. And then we installed critical barriers to isolate uh, the work area. We put poly over the uh, supply diffusers and return grills, they were sealed. And we had to cover all the smoke detectors because we knew that we were gonna go in with a halo fogger and the hyd hydrogen peroxide. So, the method of efficacy is you put the halo fogger in the corner where it is right here on the picture on the right. You put uh, chemical indicator uh, strips as far as you can on the other end of the room. And what they have is uh, an indicator strip. It turns colors when you know that it's uh, been properly, uh, the hydrogen peroxide has hit that. So you know anything in between has been covered with the indicator strips. So while that was, uh, we turned on the halo fogger, got out of the room, and then we maintained a written log for each ICU room. And those logs contained the runtime, the number of readings taken, and the level of concentrations found in each location. And why this was going on, we also monitored the outside of these containments to make sure there was no leakage into the hospital with uh, monitors specifically designed for this type of work. And once the levels were determined to be below one part per million, we were able to go inside, took down our containment, and then the facility engineer turned on the HVAC system, and then this was released back to the, the ICU department for back to their uh, normal operations. So uh, I was curious, uh, you know, how many projects that we've done so far to date. So I had somebody go into our database last night, and as of last night, we performed uh, 2,193 disinfection projects. And that's just one, our company alone. 
So there's there's so much activity going on out there right now. So um, that's it for me. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Jeff. Great. Um, and thank you to all our pa panelists for sharing their expertise with us. Um, now we're going to address as many questions as we can during the, the remaining time that we have. Um, I'm going to start with uh, the first one, which was, what was the adoption date of the Cal OSHA regulation and what is the adoption time frame? Danielle, I think that one's for you. Yeah, um, it was really quick. So originally it was proposed, if I'm remembering right, about November 12th. Um, and then it became final November 19th and it became effective November 30th. So there was a really short time frame there. Um, it is currently in effect. You're expected to be compliant now. Um, Cal OSHA has said that they've been a little easy on assessing fines until February 1st to give employers a chance to get in compliance. But starting February 1st, um, those violations they've been issuing will have hefty fines attached. So now's the time, I guess, the short answer. Great, thank you. Um, all right, if it's not covered today, can you comment on AB 685 regarding employer notification? Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll mention it briefly because not everyone's in California. That's a new piece of California legislation um, meant to address COVID-19. It follows some outbreaks in California um, that um, there was a lot of bad PR where um, the entities did not disclose the COVID exposure. So this is meant to respond to that. It requires a whole host of notice obligations. A lot of that overlaps with the Cal OSHA requirements I talked about, but there are some differences. Um, I, it's very detailed. I won't go into this, but you're more than welcome to reach out to me offline. I'm happy to talk you through 685. There's also um, a legal alert on our website that talks through 685 as well that could help you. Right. Uh, Nate, I think this one's for you. Uh, does has Whopper mold or crime scene training satisfy COVID training requirements? Uh, I think there's a lot of good fundamental training. If you've taken a has Whopper, a crime scene class, a fire class, a mold sewage class, those have fundamental and overlapping um, engineering controls. Uh, but I guess the short answer is no. The, the, so OSHA has specific requirements for training against various hazards, including this uh, SARS-CoV-2. So those are, I, I don't think they're, they're good fundamental courses, but they are, they are not addressing this particular virus. So there needs to be additional specific training to address this particular hazard. Thank you, Nate. Uh, Jeff, this one's for you. How do you determine your methodology when performing a COVID disinfection project? You know, when this first began, um, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're a contractor, we're a service provider. And, but what we did is we surrounded ourselves with some very talented people. And uh, some of those people, you know, it leads in with uh, Dr. Richard Wade. He's a chemist and a biologist. He's worked with ATI for over 30 years now, uh, back with Gary Moore, our owner. And, um, you know, we, we get his input on almost everything we do. That ICU room that we just uh, did a case study on, we would never tackle something like that unless he was involved. And we also have Devin Hoogie. He was a facility director here at Chalk Hospital. Uh, he's gone through all of our healthcare type situations in our handbook. And uh, he's been an ASHI president. And so we have people consulting with us that are experts in the industry, truly experts. And, and that's where we get a lot of this knowledge. Thank you. Um, I think this one's for Danielle. Uh, are safe, oh, actually this is for Jeff again. Are safe ionization systems a good solution for companies to further protect themselves from lawsuits and provide a safer workplace? Maybe it's two part. I guess, is it, is it safe? Jeff, that might be for you. You know, I don't know, Danielle would know that. I mean, I don't know that, to be honest with you. I would have to research that. Safe ionization systems, a good solution for companies to protect uh, themselves from, from lawsuits and protect, uh, provide a safe environment. 
Um, I'm going to give you the classic lawyer answer, which is it depends. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it depends on what your business is, what your needs are, what the realities of your workplace and your work site are. There's no hard and fast rule as to what kind of system that you need. You're just required to provide a safe workplace. And that can mean something very different for healthcare or retail or a restaurant. Um, so I, I, I would, I'd work with, you know, your consultants, your lawyers, um, whoever you have to kind of give you guidance that's specific to what you do. And there are a lot of different um, applications out there, like I went over on the first, uh, first slide. And uh, those are ones that are our preference or our team's preference. And that's what we decided to go with. Okay, um, this I believe is, is for Danielle. I manage a homeowners association in Oakland that contracts with a third party security vendor. One of the security employees contracted COVID resulting in two weeks of missed work. The security company is requesting that the homeowners association pay for the employees two weeks of PTO. Um, I guess they're they're wondering who is responsible. Yeah, so there there's no law that I'm aware of federally or at the state level that requires that you pay for the PTO of another company's employees because they may or may not have gotten it from your work site. Um, in fact, it sounds to me as though that company is passing along their obligation to pay the PTO to you or their or that they're trying to. Um, there are obligations for you in terms of notice. Um, you do have to notify um, independent contractors or um, subcontractors with employees who are on your work site if you learn of an exposure at your work site that could impact them. So there are notice obligations, but I'm not aware of any obligation that would require that you pay the PTO time. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, this one's for you. Is adding UVC to the HVA system a strategy? Yes, it's widely used, most definitely. Great. Um, Nate, this one for you. Are there training requirements for truck drivers who pick up and deliver raw materials in a facility, such as FedEx or UPS? Well, I, I guess I would go back to general duty clause, which basically you could almost answer this with, is there a reasonable exposure to that truck driver to be exposed to SARS-CoV-2? And, and the answer likely is there's not too many industries I know of that are not reasonably exposed or have workers that are reasonably exposed. So um, there would have to be some basic level of education and training for that particular truck driver um, you know, what, you know, it, it could go beyond basic training and get into the, the cleaning and disinfection of the cab, the truck, the, the dolly they use, whatever, you know, whatever um, areas they go into or touch points that they, they're in contact with. So I guess the easy answer is, yeah, there, every industry likely is going to require employees to have some level of training. Now, again, depending on what it is, might require some additional specific training, but the easy answer is yes, they would need to be trained. Okay. Uh, Jeff, what product is suggested for HVAC filtration? We use regular filters, but need to know what is suggested to assist with airborne particles related to COVID. Yeah, they make actually uh, products and uh... Uh, chemicals that are made specifically for the HVA system. Um, I would say uh, I can get this person a list if they want to contact me. And um, yeah, definitely they're specifically made just for the HVAC system. There's so many different brands uh, to name them off the top of my head. And, and, and I'll add to that too, if you don't mind, Jeff, is, you know, that their standard HEPA filtration equipment will help reduce airborne particles. The coronavirus is typically around a 0.1 micron non-mucosal droplet size. So there will be some filtration benefits with just using your standard HEPA filtration equipment um, to reduce airborne particles of, of the viron. Right, um, Danielle, do you think the new OSHA requirements will curtail 
the return to office by employers? Sure. Um, so first of all, we don't know what the new OSHA requirements will look like. Um, we only know that OSHA has been instructed to pass in a, uh, some emergency guidance. Um, so um, I'm uh, looking at my crystal ball a little bit um, and using California as an, as an example. Um, it depends, I think, on if you've got essential workers or not. If you have essential workers, um, they're likely already returned in some capacity. Um, so it will certainly um, put new obligations or um, uh, requirements to make sure that you meet those standards um, into place. For those employers who have the bulk of their workforce um, working remotely, sure, um, it could absolutely delay the return to work, either because you're making sure you're getting OSHA compliant or because you really don't need your employees physically in the workplace. Um, and there's a cost associated with um, becoming OSHA compliant and, and maybe it is safer to continue to keep employees um, at home temporarily. So uh, sure, depending on uh, the industry and what you do, I can see that being an, an impact. Another OSHA question, Danielle. Um, is there an OSHA requirement for regular cleanings in, in a retail-like space? So I expect that that may be part of what we see come out over the next couple of weeks. Right now, as Nate said, it's a general duty requirement. We're talking about national OSHA. Uh, for the California OSHA, those, the new emergency standard does include some of that uh, requirement. And it varies based on your industry and what your needs are, but there are some um, requirements there under the Cal OSHA. And I expect we may see that um, coming in the next couple of weeks for the nationwide. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll just add to that a little bit too, is that, you know, we can't just hand a, a chemical to an employee and tell them to go clean if they've never been trained on the product, because some products require certain personal protective equipment. Um, and, and that's where we've seen some of the litigation cases where employees are just being asked to clean their work environment, their workstations without any training. And we've seen some pretty um, crazy things out there, but that that's, that's a huge liability if you you, you put a chemical in someone's hand and say, go clean this when they, they don't have any training. They have no, um, you know, th they don't even know what products in their hand. That's, that's a big liability problem. And Nate, I'll add to that too, is the first thing you train your workforce is that they need to be reading the SDS, find out how to, you know, the application is, find out what the PPE is in order to do that. That's where it starts. They have to be reading the SDS in order to see how to use that product. Yeah, and this question is talking about regular trainings, um, but certainly if there's any kind of outbreak or exposure, you're going to want to look at um, a, a deeper disinfection, right? And um, something more um, uh, significant. And that isn't necessarily a requirement yet, although I expect that out of OSHA, um, but it certainly is within the CDC guidance. Um, and it, it does serve to protect you in meeting your obligations to your employees. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, if exposed, can employees be directed to work from home while in the quarantine period? Danielle. Um, yeah, it, uh, I hate, I hate saying it depends, um, <laughs> but um, if the employee is exposed but not showing symptoms, uh, versus um, has tested positive and is showing symptoms, those are two different things. Um, and uh, just like any medical condition that you are um, accommodating or, or addressing in the workplace, um, it's going to impact uh, whether or not that person can work. Um, if they're experiencing symptoms and they tested positive, they may have a doctor's note that says, you know, that they can't work um, and that they have to be out of the workplace. If they've merely been exposed, they don't show any symptoms, maybe they don't have a positive test, that could be an option. Uh, but it is very employee and situation specific. Great. And one final question, uh, Jeff, this is for you. Uh, we don't have HEPA filters, only MERV 11 or 13. Will chemicals help? You know, again, that's probably a question I would refer to our chemist. Um, you know, I don't know, Nate, if you have an answer on that. Um, I, I think the MERV rating, um, the higher the MERV rating, uh, um, you're going to get different filtration benefits from different MERV ratings. So, um, I guess I don't know if I can entirely answer that, but I think you would you would get 
a higher MERV rating, you're going to get some benefit from filtration. The, the question would be, though, the particle size and, you know, the coronavirus at around 0.1 micron is what the research I've seen. So you may not get really great filtration with a MERV rating at, what do they say, 10 or 11? Um, 11 or 13. Or 11 or 13. So I, I think there's probably some benefit, but maybe not as good as something that you, but some HVAC systems are going to be limited with the MERV rating you can put in an HVAC system. So you have to be careful about putting a, a really aggressive filter in a, a system that could, you know, cause damage to the HVAC unit. All right. That's a tough one. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, it looks like we're out of time. Um, should you be interested in learning more about the topics that we discussed, please feel free to reach out to our panelists directly. I'm going to leave this slide up for, for a few seconds so that you could take a quick screenshot. Um, we'll also be sending out a, a video recording of this webinar so you can watch it or share it with members of your team. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And we hope that you guys have a wonderful day. Thank you all. Thanks, Maria. Thanks.